Good morning, gentlemen. Gentlemen, uh, Saint, happy St. Patrick's Day. Today we're going to talk about the tactical and strategic bombing of during World War II. Uh, and the reason that G G Germany is going to have a really tough time winning this war is the fact that they did not believe in strategic bombing, the ability to destroy the enemy's uh, capacities for making war, factories and factory workers and things like that. The Germans believed that tactical bombing was only important for the battlefield, you know, whatever supports the Blitzkrieg. Now, the funny thing about it is, is that England is going to lead the way in strategic bombing and the United States will follow. But one thing before we get started, the Americans are going to bomb in the daylight for accuracy and the British are going to bomb at night because they want to make sure that their bomber crews are safe. Yes. Now, this is the definition of strategic bombing. The goal of defeating the enemy by destroying its morale, its economic ability to produce, and transport material to the theaters of military operation. That airplane you see on the bottom is a Abro Lancaster. It is the backbone of the Royal Air Force's bombing campaign, and it is used extensively to reach deep into Germany and other Axis out Axis countries and to destroy their ability to make war. Unfortunately, it's also one of the greatest airplanes for loss during World War II. These crews were lucky that they made 15 missions. All right. Daylight precision bombing refers to the idea of attempting aerial bombing on a target with some degree of accuracy and to limit collateral damage. We don't want to hurt the innocent people surrounding these German factories because we truly believe to keep the German people on our side, we needed to do our best to only destroy military targets. The downside of this is that we're going to see that a lot of crews are going to lose their lives trying to protect the innocent lives of Germans. But later we're going to realize that this idealistic approach to fighting war is not possible. All right. So we're going to come up with a doctrine. And that doctrine is going to be the idea that maybe by bombing Germany, we won't have to invade. This was a very optimistic hope, but it's not going to happen. No matter how successful we were in destroying the factories of Europe, Normandy is going to have to be reality on June 6, 1944. Yeah, we really hope we didn't have to invade the continent, but even though we thought we could get away with it, we didn't. The Royal Air Force leads the way. Now, when they first started doing this, man, they realized right off the bat that bombing in daylight was just stupid. It can't be done, all right? The casualties were horribly high. So they decided to switch to night bombing. And with night bombing, men, they just do what they call basically carpet bombing. They draw a square on the map, they fly over the middle of the night, and they drop all the bombs in that square. And if one out of 30 bombs hits the target, they're happy. They don't worry about it. They just want to get their crews home. The Germans, who have not learned how to fight at night, are going to really emphasize the idea of using anti-aircraft weapons. You can see the famous Krupp 88 on the left, and you can see the result that even at 25 and 30,000 feet, what these weapons can do to a British bomber. All right, there is a major shift here. You see the photograph in the bottom right? That's Bomber Harris. He's going to be the man who's going to be in charge of the Royal Air Force's bombing of targets at night. And they're going to start switching to large German industrial cities. And they're going to measure the success not only in destroying the factories, but in destroying the workers and killing the workers that work in those factories. So men, this is the concept of total war. And even though everybody knows that Bomber Harris is right, you've got to kill workers and their machines, he becomes a very unpopular, shall we say, scapegoat for the British government. They know he's right, but nobody wants to sit down and drink tea with him because you're openly suggesting the killing 
of civilians. But I guess in war, men, there are no real innocent people. Germany defends itself. Very quickly, the Germans are going to learn how to master the radar. They're going to take their daytime bombers, convert them into nighttime bombers. And if you look at this particular Junker 88 on the left, you see the aerials, they are actually picking up radar admissions from the British, picking up communications. That's how they're going to hone in on the subject. And if you look in the spawn of the aircraft right behind the cockpit, you'll see two cannons. That's called jazz music. Strange term for the Germans to use. It was called the jazz music. And what these bombers would do was to fly under the, gun the bellies of the Royal Air Force bombers and rake them with cannon fire, knowing that the bombers did not have a belly gun. And if you look on the right, you can see that this particular approach was very successful. Every one of those silhouettes on the rudder of that aircraft represents a destroyed Russian or British bomber. This is why the Battle of Britain was so important, men. England becomes the world's largest aircraft carrier. And in 1942, we get into the business. The 8th Air Force, who's going to cut its teeth in North Africa, are now going to start occupying all of Southeast England and South England. And we're going to come up with a policy with the British of around-the-clock bombing. And in 1943, we really start cutting our teeth into giving the Germans and the Italians, no rest whatsoever. We come in the daytime, and the British come at night. A round the clock bombing should break the morale of the enemy. What do you know, men? In every great organization, there are problems. And one of the problems we had here was coordination. We just didn't sit down and figure out with Britain what we wanted to do. We had a rough idea. They did their thing, we did ours. We really failed to communicate effectively. But Bomber Harris picked a nice one here. He decided that he wanted to set the example, and he went after two cities. One was called Hamburg, and one was called Dredston. And Hamburg and Dredston uh, were going to be cities going to be about, going to be about firebombed. And using firebombs for the first time meant that you're going to have a conflagration of Basically, hell. The whole idea is that we're going to use napalm and cinderaries and white phosphorus to destroy the city. But men, once you start using these weapons, the fire is out of control. And as you can see in Hamburg, right, that poor city, which was bombed for three days and three nights, never recovered. The firestorm killed hundreds and hundreds of innocent people. And it was basically a war crime. We have to call it a war crime, and that's what it was. And Bomber Harris said that if he lost the war, he would have been tried. Well, men, we start attacking Berlin in 1943 and 44, and we're going to be attacking Berlin over 400 times. This is what's going to cause Adolf Hitler to live in the bunker 50 feet below the Reichstag. They couldn't guarantee his life. The bombing was so bad that he had to go underground from 1943 on, and he never came out again except on special occasions. But we're going to learn something really the hard way. Swinefurt, Michigan, uh, sorry, Swinefurt, I said Michigan, <laughs> Swinefurt, Germany, where they make ball bearings. And on one single day, Black Thursday, we're going to lose 50 bombers over Swinefurt. The city was destroyed. 500 American airmen did not return, and the Germans were able to go back to manufacturing ball bearings in only three months. If you look on the right side, you can see a B-17 flying fortress in deep trouble over the city of Swinefurt. Men, this is the B-24 Liberator. This is the most manufactured bomber the Americans ever had. They flew in large formations so they could protect each other. It won't be until 1943 or 44 that we really start getting fighter protection that can go all the way to the target. Look at this slide here, men. 
Can you imagine being in an open cockpit? You can see the gunners have no protection there. The fuselage has to be open so the machine guns can stick out. And you're in temperature anywhere between 20 and 40 degrees below zero. Men, these guys are not much older than you. Some of them were 17, 18, 19 years of age, and they had to fly 25 missions successfully before they could go home. These were very, very brave men. Finally, we get an answer, someone to protect our bombers. This is the P-51 Mustang. Some people have called this airplane the most sexiest fighter of World War II. I could agree. Men, this bomber is going to give the Luftwaffe and the Messerschmitts and Falkwolfs all they can handle. They're going to be a big, big friend, even though they're called the little friends. And their job is to keep the bombers alive until they reach their target, and more importantly, keep the bombers alive until they get back home in England. You know, Mustangs are still flying to this day. That's a fantastic aircraft, the North American P-51. Men, you look at the long range possibility of things, right? And we have to ask ourselves, did it break the morale of the German people? And I'm sorry to tell you, it did not. The German people simply went underground. The German people spread their factories out. The German people became more determined to resist the Allies because of this indiscriminate bombing. Men, if you were a German and you did not hate the Allies and you weren't really a Nazi, after your city was firebombed and your whole neighborhood was destroyed and nothing was left, you became a Nazi. What I'm trying to say is that we actually forced people into choosing a side and they chose a side out of revenge, not because they were true Nazis. And the long-term effect, strategic bombing may have not been as successful as we hoped. Sidebar, did you know that we bombed, we dropped more bombs on Vietnam during the Vietnam uh, conflict to the 1960s and 70s than we dropped on all of Germany and Japan? And it did not even break the morale of the Vietnamese people. In fact, they handed us our first loss in 1975. That's when we left Saigon. And this is a memorial you find in England. All gave some, and some gave all. And to this day, men, whole generations of people still admire the fighter pilots and the bomber pilots. But you see, the fighter pilots was considered to be kind of a glamorous position where the bomber pilots, you were considered to be a truck driver, right? So, you know, you look at Goose and Maverick, you look at Top Gun, right? It's sexy to be a fighter pilot. To be a bomber pilot, they thought you're driving a dump truck. But those dump, dump trucks had to help us, and they did. It definitely shortened the war. Not as effectively and efficiently as we hoped, but it was a doctrine. And as a doctrine, we're going to have to study for the next 30 years. Because the question remains with the Army and the United States Air Force, does strategic bombing break the will of the people? And we may have to argue that it doesn't. So gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed my first uh, attempt at YouTube. And let's review some really good questions, okay, that could show up on a quiz. What is the difference between tactical and strategic? Mm-hmm. Why did Germany not build a long-range bomber fleet? Well, I can tell you, if it didn't help the tanks and it didn't help the Blitzkrieg, we don't need it. Who was the man in charge of strategic bombing for England? Good question. What was the first air force from the United States to be stationed in England? And what part of England were they in? That's right, the east and the southeast. England became the world's largest aircraft carrier. Another question I have for you, and it's a good one. What were the two cities that did not really were military targets that were first firebombed to total destruction? Hamburg and Dresden. That's absolutely right. And so we're going to continue these podcasts, or I should say YouTube videos, and as I get my confidence up, we will start to make them better and better. So gang, please stay safe. Know that I'm thinking about you, and I'm actually sitting in room A21 looking at these empty desks, 
wishing I was back with you guys. So, you know, and the words of uh, our boy uh, um, Dick Winters, hang tough, and I'll see you soon.